In this lecture, we're going to be talking about psychology um, and its twin subject, behavioural economics, which is the interaction between psychology and economics. In the last few lectures, um, we've come across a number of cases where people break into systems by using a plausible story or just bullying the target. Back in the 1980s, when ATMs were rolled out at scale, somebody who had snatched your wallet or purse would phone you up, pretend to be from the bank and say, OK, your, your card's been stolen, so tell us your PIN so that I can go into the computer and cancel your card. And if the story was plausible, then enough of the time somebody would hand over their PIN. We also discussed in the context of my laundering how one of the big threats to students like you nowadays is the risk that you might be fished into acting as money mules and passing on through your bank account money that's been stolen from somewhere um, so that it goes somewhere else and that can end up getting you into trouble. Um, but there are many um, attacks of much more consequence, attacks on companies and attacks on governments, uh, because as we mentioned in our second lecture, spear phishing is one of the main ways in which intelligence agencies nowadays uh, break into facilities in target countries uh, and in these countries' infrastructure. Uh, we also discussed in the third lecture how the organisational defence is to control external communications so that with luck, none of your critical staff ever get to see an email from outside and to limit the harm that any one person or machine could do if the worst happens. And we discuss things like mandatory access control and operational security. But here, in this lecture, we're interested in the psychology in what makes spear phishing and um, other types of fraud work. Now, um, what caused phishing to be scaled up uh, was in um, the mid 2000s when lots of people started doing banking online. Suddenly in 2006, it became a big thing in the UK where the banks lost 35 million pounds uh, and 33 million of that was by one bank, the bank that was slowest and laziest at um, aggressively tracing stolen funds and US banks were losing maybe 200 million by then. Now the lures that people use have evolved over time. One classic one was, thank you for adding a new email address to your PayPal account. Uh, and then the mark becomes very anxious. Oh, I'm under attack. So they, they click on the link to PayPal that's been given with this email. Uh, and, and of course, it isn't the proper PayPal website, but a simulacrum of it. And once the bad guys have got your PayPal um, password, they'll either empty your account or use your PayPal account as a money mule account to transfer stolen money from one place to another. Recently in the pandemic, um, we've had people um, phoning up and sending texts and sending emails saying this is NHS text and, test and trace, and then uh, demanding all sorts of information from people which can be abused in various ways. If you hand over too much personal information, it can be used to impersonate you by opening a bank account in your name. And these kind of um, psychological attacks can be combined with technological exploits such as caller ID spoofing. They're also becoming pervasive in that um, um, the, the, the latest figures uh, from um, banks and from surveys um, show that 80% of UK adults were targeted last year. Uh, many were for other scams, but still this is one of the um, big um, hazards uh, of online life and one of the big sources of harm um, as a side effect of the way we live our lives online. At the top of the pinnacle of harm is spear phishing, where people um, are targeted individually uh, by bad actors. Now, we first came across this in 2009, because in 2008, when the Winter Olympics were held in Peking, uh, the Chinese spear fished the Tibetan government in exile in Dharamsala in India. And one of my research students happened to be in Delhi waiting for a visa, so he went up there um, and helped them um, clear it up. And it turned out that the Chinese had impersonated one of the Tibetan monks uh, who worked for the Dalai Lama um, and sent an email to another monk, which had an, a PDF attachment with a JavaScript buffer overflow in it. And once they had infected one machine, they then went sideways to take over the monk's mail server, which was in California. And the result of this was that whenever any monk sent uh, an email with a PDF attached to it to another monk, it would attach with the it would arrive with the uh, JavaScript buffer overflow, which is a, a very very 
pernicious attack. Just imagine you're sitting in a room five feet away from somebody else and they send you a PDF and you say to them, John, did you send me that PDF? And he says, yup. And between his desk and your desk, it's gone halfway around the world to a mail server in California and it's come back with teeth attached. This kind of technique is now one of the main techniques used in both ransomware and cyber war. And people have done research on the proportion of people who will fall for a lure. And if you personalize the lure so that it appears to come from someone you know, and it's about a subject about which the two of you have re recently been speaking, then you can get something like a 30% yield. Sometimes these have significant consequences. For example, in the 2016 US general uh, presidential election, um, candidate Clinton's chief of staff, John Podesta, um, got spearfished by Russian military intelligence. They got his Gmail account and they got all sorts of emails which he had sent and received from Democratic supporters um, asking for various favours, for jobs, for uh, preferment and all the rest of it. And this incriminating material was leaked out through WikiLeaks um, over the next month or two and um, Trump made a big deal of it and in the end won the election by a small margin. So how do you stop spear phishing? Well, if you're at a really tightly locked down employer like a bank or an intelligence agency or a big tech company, um, there's all sorts of techniques used to stop um, staff getting dangerous emails. Um, in, in some places, you just can't get external email at all. In others, all attachments will have been um, laundered or will have been put into a cloud service. You may find that it's impossible to download a PDF onto your PC, that you have to look at, look at it online in the cloud via viewer. There's mail filtering, there's all sorts of stuff. So um, that's necessary because you can't prevent everybody clicking on links. There will always be a few percent of people who will be tricked into um, clicking on uh, something that looks attractive and harmless. So what tends to happen in terms of attacks um, is that you go after the, um, the weakest link. If you're an intelligence agency, uh, you might go for political campaigners and journalists. If you're a ransomware gang, uh, you don't try and install ransomware in GCHQ. You go for hospitals and ordinary firms um, who don't have high class defences, uh, but are able to pay out hundreds of thousands of pounds or even millions of pounds to get their systems back. Okay, having motivated the study of um, psychology, let's dive in. Um, it's important to understand the various ways in which people make errors um, um, in, in psychological processing, because typically, if you're trying to mislead people um, or defraud them, you're trying to cause them to make some kind of an error. Now, errors arise at different levels in our psychological stack. At the top level, we deal with novel problems in a conscious way, that's what rational thinking evolved for um, in the last few hundred thousand years of our biological evolution. But when we come across a frequently evolved problem, they're dealt with by using rules that we evolve, which are partly automatic, and over time the rules give way to skill, the, the reflex actions that um, basically uh, happen in the lower parts of our brain um, and in the reflexes at our fingertips, and which are much older in evolutionary terms. Now, this ability to automatize routine actions uh, leads to absent-minded slips or following the wrong rule. And there's also systematic limits to rationality, the so-called heuristics and biases that people discuss in behavioral economics, as well as social psychology, uh, which deals with how we interact with other people uh, and how our thinking is conditioned by the fact that we're members of groups. And this um, way of splitting stuff at different layers of the stack enables us to get a rough taxonomy of errors. At the top, you've got mistakes that people make which are based on their knowledge uh, or on their ignorance. They simply make decisions based on the wrong facts. Then, a little bit further down and more complex, there are processing biases based on how human brains work on the um, heuristics that we evolved over millions of years to take decisions quickly under uncertainty. You've also got rule-based mistakes where we um, have got a procedure 
uh, that we've practiced, that we've uh, learned and understood, but you simply apply the wrong one. And then there are various slips and lapses. For example, you can forget your plans and intentions. You can have habit intrusion. Um, about once a week, for example, um, I, I, I tend to go to my daughter's for dinner, but it often happens uh, that you, know, you just take the wrong turning on the road uh, and go home instead, because if you're going home four days a week and going to your daughter's one day a week, then going home is the habit and that can intrude. Another example is premature exits from action sequences. Um, with ATMs, for example, uh, if you go to a cash machine in America, you'll see that it gives you your cash first and your card only second. Whereas in Britain, when you make a cash withdrawal, you get your card first and your cash last. And the reason the British banks do that um, is that they discovered that if you give people their cash first, that's the objective of going to the cash machine. And if at that point, um, the customer gets distracted at all, then he may forget and leave his card in the machine. And um, given UK rules that um, cards left in ATMs are destroyed rather than being posted through the interbank system back to the user, this costs money. And so the banks decided that they will um, minimize this um, kind of error uh, by giving out the cash last. Then people can misidentify objects and signals. And these misidentifications can often be understood in terms of Bayesian inference. And then finally, those retrieval failures. If somebody's name is at the tip of your tongue or if one habit interferes with another. And when you try and work out a robust and safe user interface uh, for some product, you have to bear in mind all these different types of error. The next thing to um, talk about is social psychology. Uh, this is about how uh, people behave um, in relation to other people. And there are three experiments um, going back, oh, half a century and more now, um, which show people's vulnerability to the influence of others. Um, the first two are in the 1960s. Um, Solomon Ash did an experiment in which he would get an experimental subject into a group of people where the other people in the group were all shills. They were all um, helping him do the experiment. And um, what they would do is show some um, obvious fact to the experimental subject, which the other people in the experiment would deny. Um, the, the, the line A would be longer than line B, but everybody else would say that line A was longer. And Solomon found that about two thirds of his experimental subject would deny obvious facts in order not to disagree with other people in their group. Building on this, um, another psychologist in the 1960s, Stanley Milgram, who was trying to figure out why um, so many ordinary people in Germany um, had gone along with the Holocaust and had assisted the authorities in deporting Jews, gypsies and others to the death camps, um, wanted to work out whether um, you know, what proportion of the population would follow um, illegal and unreasonable orders. And so what he did was to do an experiment in which the experimental subject was told that they were um, taking part in an educational experiment and that the new education system involved giving rewards and punishments to the student. And the student was an actor in cahoots with the experimenter. And um, the experimental subject was repeatedly told that they had to increase the voltage of a shock that they were going to inflict on the experimental subject. Uh, and he found that 60% of all experimental subjects would inflict a potentially fatal shock on the so-called student because the experimenter, uh, as the student made um, one false, one wrong answer after another, the experimenter said, right, you've got to turn it up to 80 volts, to 100 volts, to 120 volts. And when the experimental subject pressed the button, the student would scream and writhe in pain and in some cases say they had a heart condition and they would surely die if they got any more. And the experimental said, no, you must continue with the experiment. And the discovery was that a majority of subjects would continue doing something that was clearly harmful um, and, and, and also, in fact, illegal. And then finally, there was the Stanford Prison Experiment where Philip Zimbardo recruited a number of um, students and got them to play the roles of prison guards and convicts uh, in a prison which they set up in Stanford University's yard. 
and this had to be stopped after a few days because some of the prison guards were seriously mistreating the, um, the students who were playing the role of prisoners. And that showed that even where you don't have an experiment of giving orders to people to misbehave, they can misbehave simply as a result of the role um, that they are set socially to play. So, this brings us to the social brain hypothesis and the, um, there has been a big debate in the psychology community about this, uh, about um, why did we evolve um, our intelligence in the first place. And until the 1970s, the view was that we got smart in order to make better tools and that over time evolutionary pressure caused us to have bigger brains and um, we uh, moved from having old Stone Age tools, which were you know, very crude stone axes, to new Stone Age tools, which were very much better, and then to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Computer Age and so on. However, people began to realise about 50 years ago that we actually got smart first, uh, because there's no difference in the um, stone tools that you find um, hominids using one and a half million years ago, um, with those that we were using 50,000 years ago at the end of the Old Stone Age. But 50,000 years ago, we were anatomically modern humans. So we acquired our intelligence first, and then we learned how to make better tools. So where did the intelligence come from? Well, um, the view that primatologists and evolutionary psychologists have nowadays is that when Africa dried out one and a half million years ago, we started living in bigger groups because we were living on the grassland rather than in the forest. And so we might be in hunting groups of 20 or 30 or up to 150 people. And it was then discovered that primate brain size correlates well with group size, because if you um, graph the, the, the mass of a primate's brain as a proportion of body weight, and you graph that against the size of the social group, then with one or two outliers, this gives us a very good correlation and it tells us that Homo sapiens, modern humans, evolved to thrive in a group of about 150 people. And the explanation for this, um, on, on which many people agree, is that you need big brains in order to track more relationships. If you have to keep track not just of a small family group, uh, but of cousins and second cousins and unrelated people in neighbouring hunting groups, uh, then you have to have an idea of you know, who's having an affair with whom and who dislikes whom and who's an ally of whom. And the Machiavellian aspect of this um, has led to quite a bit of work around the foundations of deception. And the insight is that if you're better at deception and at detecting deception in others, you're more likely to have descendants. And in big groups, um, it's not just all lovey-dovey, of course, there's intrigue and there's conflict and there's deception and there's the need to figure out when people are being level with you and when they're trying to deceive you. And so a modern view of deception is that it goes way, way back a million years or so uh, when we started living in bigger groups on the African savannah. Another point um, that's worth taking from evolutionary psychology and also from social psychology and criminology um, is the role of gender. Now, men are very much more likely to commit crime than women. Um, in just about every society from which we have got statistics, um, the male crime rate is about 10 times the rate of crimes committed by women. And crimes tend to be overwhelmingly committed by low status men um, who tend to have issues about their gender role or their place in the social hierarchy. And this has got implications for cybercrime, and it's also got implications for online crime and abuse, and even the uh, propagation of terrorism, uh, terrorist recruitment in online communities. Um, one of the things that's been discovered recently is that the majority of terrorists and of mass shooters commit violent crime against women first, and one of the things that's tied up with cybercrime and indeed with gaming communities online um, is uh, misogyny. And misogyny is very strongly linked to the alt-right movement. And there was uh, an incident, Gamergate, which is described in my book, 
where people got together online, men got together online to protest about the fact that women not only play online games, but even um, write online games. And some men who had issues about their gender role got annoyed at this, and there was uh, a, lot of, a lot of online unpleasantness, uh, which resulted in um, groups of, of people being recruited to the alt-right movement and ending up supporting um, Donald Trump. There are links to cybercrime too, which are complex and which we're still working on. Uh, but the, the, um, the fact remains that the great majority of cyber criminals um, are young men. And um, th th there is um, continuing work uh, trying to understand the, the pathways that uh, may take a young man from being a gamer, for example, to being someone who uses game cheats, to somebody who trades game cheats, to uh, somebody who organizes denial of service attacks and then perhaps even somebody who writes malware. Okay, having discussed the deeper principles of psychology involved, let's see how psychology relates to marketing. So there's a number of standard techniques that salespeople use, which are described at great length in Cialdini's book, Influence, Science and Practice, if you're interested in the gory detail. And here are some of the principles. Firstly, there's reciprocation. In the lecture in economics, we described the prisoner's dilemma and how you can solve that by having an iterated prisoner's dilemma where at each step you cooperate with the person uh, that you're uh, dealing with co cooperated last time round. And this has been baked into us by evolution. Even monkeys do tit for tat. So you use reciprocation to draw people in. You give them something free to begin with. If you have somebody coming into your office and you're trying to sell them a house, for example, you start off by giving them a cup of coffee. You then talk about social proof because people like to do what other people do. And so you would talk about how you know, lots of people in Cambridge are buying houses in the castle region. It's very fashionable and everybody from successful tradesmen to professors are buying houses there. People also like to buy from people that they can relate to. So you would um, dress appropriately and you'd pitch your language and your tone at the uh, uh, prospect who's sitting in front of you. You would talk more or less posh depending on their social class. You seek at all costs to be likable and to be someone that the mark can feel comfortable with. People also like to defer to authority. And so if you're in the business of selling your house um, or selling a house, then um, it's helpful if you can be some authority on prices nearby. So an estate agent might say, well, we've sold seven houses in Castle this month and um, give details on what the houses were and what they went for and perhaps show others in the window so that the, uh, the mark has got some idea that they're speaking to an authority on the subject. What you also try and do is to get a commitment and to follow through because people like to be consistent. So you qualify the prospect. You say you're looking for a house. You're looking for a house in Castle. How many bedrooms? Three. Uh, do you want an apartment or a semi-detached or a detached house? Semi will do. All right. Get some kind of commitment. And then it's just a matter of deciding whether you will manage to sell in the house on Histon Road or the house on Oxford Road or, or wherever. And these are absolutely standard sales and marketing techniques, um, which Cialdini and other writers on marketing have written about at great length. Context and framing um, also matter, particularly online. Now, framing effects um, include, for example, the estate agent who shows you a crummy house first, so that once he's got a commitment from you and your partner that you're going to buy a house in Castle, they go and show you some tumble-down wreck uh, that would take £100,000 to fix, and you kind of shake your heads and say, no, we need a place we can move into in two months. Um, th there's a similar trick um, that you may use if you take along an ugly friend on a double date that is another way of making your offer look better. And similarly, um, you can do um, tricks online whereby the thing that you're trying to push the mark to buy becomes a more attractive proposition than something they've also looked at. Another trick is to get a user fixated on task completion. Um, we mentioned earlier in the context of phishing uh, that um, one of the old tricks was to tell the, the mark that there was a new payee on their PayPal account so that they get fixated on finding out why that happens and they don't pay attention to the fact that they're not on the genuine PayPal website. Now, an example that takes this to extreme lengths is advanced fee frauds. 
Um, historically, there were a lot of uh, scammers in West Africa who um, said, you know, hello, I am um, the widow of um, General Abacha, who was the dictator of Nigeria and has five billion dollars sitting in a Swiss bank account. And I need the help of somebody outside Nigeria to get this money out of the country. And you can have a commission if you help me. Now, only perhaps one in a million persons who were contacted would fall for this fraud. But when people did fall for it, they could fall very, very hard. And thanks to the wonders of spam, it's possible to contact a million people fairly quickly and find the one who is the sucker. And people who were in the process of being um, fished by um, one of these scammers could be visited by the police and told, look, um, there isn't um, any abacha billion pound fortune for you to get. This is complete nonsense. You mustn't send um, the money that you're told to pay in order to pay the taxes to get it out of the bank account. It's, it's a complete con. You'll never get your money back and say, yes, I hear what you say, but I absolutely have to get my money. It's my money. Go away. Don't stop me. And the detectives would have sometimes just shake their heads and um, uh, leave the poor guy alone to um, become a victim. One related thing is that risk salience is hugely dependent on context. And if you can make something appear to be a bit fun and a bit naughty, perhaps, then people will do things that they would never do in a more um, serious and sober-sided environment. There was a fascinating experiment that people at Carnegie Mellon did on privacy about 10 years ago. Um, they were trying to measure students' sensitivity to privacy, and so they concocted a privacy meter, which was basically a list of embarrassing questions. Have you ever cheated on a date? Have you ever smoked dope? Have you ever cheated in an exam? You know, that sort of thing. And the score that you got on this um, test was the number of questions that you answered before you, before you stopped saying, hang on a minute, there's something not right about this. So they did the experiment on, on three groups of people. Um, the uh, first group was a control group of people who were just doing the experiment in Decision Sciences CMU. The second was a group of people who had been um, um, primed on privacy. The experimenters, as I said, were experimenting people's privacy preferences. Uh, and um, they gave assurances of privacy, saying, your answers will be uh, encrypted using AES. We won't keep a, a record of your IP address and so on and so forth. And although they gave assurances of privacy to the experimental subjects, the subjects clicked on many fewer of these questions because they were suspicious to begin with. The third group of people with whom they did the experiment um, were not sent to a university website, but to a, a domain they'd registered called howbadareyou.com. And there was a little devil with red horns and a tail saying, go on, show us how bad you are. And there the students simply answered all the questions. And so it's possible to get people to do extremely dangerous things um, if you get across the idea that, hey, this is, this is just a laugh, it's a giggle, it's a party. And so you're pinned here. So how does fraud psychology work? Well, basically it's all the above, um, plus a number of things that fraudsters have honed over the years. One is appealing to the mark's kindness. Another is appealing to their dishonesty. And when you've got an advance fee fraud where you think you're helping um, the, the widow of a Nigerian dictator to get his stolen billions out of a Swiss bank account, then that's what's happening. You know, you're becoming a conspirator in money laundering, which, if nothing else, should stop you going to the police afterwards. Another thing that you do is you distract people so that they act automatically rather than stopping to think. And another thing is that you arouse them so that they act viscerally. Um, you know, in addition to the party atmosphere, you can have some sex, drugs, rock and roll type vibe around. And there's a number of videos um, that you can see on YouTube. The Real Hustle was a BBC TV series a few years ago where three actors went and acted out a, a large number of, of frauds against um, innocent members of the public who were then told that they had been suckered uh, and asked to sign a release for the footage of them to be used in the TV show and enough of them did so that they got a decent show out, out of it. And if you want the, the gory details of uh, fraud psychology, there's a paper of uh, Modich and Lee which looks at it from an academic point of view. And there's Kevin Mitnick's book, The Art of Deception, uh, gives you his experiences 
um, as a phone freak and hacker back in the 1980s and 1990s when he specialised in persuading employees of phone companies um, that he was actually a phone company engineer and should be given access to their systems. So that's fraud psychology. And one of the things that we're always exploring is what's the boundary of this with economics. We mentioned tit for tat, for example. We have talked about whether people um, act um, automatically or carelessly or for a laugh rather than stopping and rationally considering things the way economists assume people do. So back in 2008, we ran a workshop where we brought together psychologists, behavioral economists, security engineers. And one of the things that we were um, wrestling with in this workshop um, is the following questions. Um, most people don't worry enough about computer security and how could this be fixed? And most people worry too much about terrorism and how could that be fixed? Well, um, at the end of the workshop, one of our participants um, uh, said, well, you know, from a psychologist's point of view, this is fairly straightforward. Um, if you want people to worry more about computer security, you've got to pass a law saying that their screensaver should be JAWS so that people are a bit more scared of computers. But it's not in the interest of the computer industry to do that. The computer industry uh, tries to make its products attractive and cute and sexy and non-threatening so that people will use them more. And similarly, you could get people to worry a bit less about terrorism um, if you um, and took all the uh, guys with machine guns away from the airport and um, uh, put in nice pastel sofas and put Mozart on the, um, uh, on the loudspeakers instead. Uh, but that's less likely to be fixed because a display of power and, and, and of security is considered by many politicians and national leaders to be in their interests. Because when people are slightly scared about external threats, they're more likely to vote for the government in charge rather than for the opposition. So we've got a, 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 three, a kind of three-legged stool here um, where in order to build systems, we rely on engineering, economics and psychology. And there is some structural and necessary tension between the three. Now, this uh, brings us to behavioral economics, which is the study of how people um, make consistently irrational um, economic decisions um, in ways that you can actually uh, measure and sometimes you can capitalize on. And the summary here is that people tend to make buying decisions with their emotions and then rationalize afterwards because most of the time we're too busy to research each purchase and in the ancestral evolutionary environment we had to make flight or fight decisions quickly. Um, so if you're um, foraging on the African savanna and you hear a rustle in the grass behind you, um, you know, one of the things that you can do is just hop up a tree just to be on the safe side, just in case it's a lion, because climbing a tree doesn't cost you very much, uh, but being eaten by a lion um, costs you an awful lot. And the older parts of the brain that um, we developed back then and which kept us alive for millions of years um, before we developed analytical thought are entirely oriented towards making reasonably good flight or fight decisions and making them quickly. And um, there's uh, a, a book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that you may have come across by Daniel Kahneman, who won the Economics Nobel Prize for founding the study of behavioral economics about 20 years ago. And these reflexes were documented by Kahneman, by Amos Tversky, his colleague, and by a number of behavioral economists in such as Richard Taylor. And they appear in mental uh, shortcuts that people use, such as equating quality with price and also equating quality with scarcity. And these mental shortcuts are um, the physiological basis of, of many of the marketing stratagems that we've been discussing earlier. Now, one of the interesting things that um, Kahneman and Sversky came up with, um, gosh, about 40 years ago now, is a theory of risk misperception. There's an old saying uh, that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, and you can kind of understand the significance of this in the ancestral evolutionary environment. If people are 
hungry much of the time, then actual food has got a, a certain value. But is it possible to um, turn this into maths? Is it possible to get a decent model of it? Well, behavioral economics works on problems like that. And one of the ways of um, understanding risk misperception um, is by um, trying to figure out how utility, that is the value that an individual gets uh, from a certain quantity of goods, um, is a function of gains or losses. Now, if people were completely rational, as economists assume, uh, then the dotted line on this graph would give you that trade-off, that um, a gain of um, one pound or one sheep or whatever uh, gets you as much positive benefit as a loss of one sheep or one pound would on the other. And people would also be um, indifferent um, to different expected losses, so they would be um, indifferent to either getting £10 for certain or a 50% chance of £20. However, once you bring in uncertainty, the curve bends, um, as you can see with the red line here, in that if people are offered either £10 in the hand or a 50% chance of £20, they'll usually prefer the former. But if, on the other hand, they're offered a loss of £10 or a 50% chance of a loss of £20, they'll tend to gamble. Um, why is this? Well, you can think how it would go through in the ancestral evolutionary environment. Solid gains are better than losses, uh, but if there's a risk of loss rather than a certain loss, um, you may uh, wish to take the gamble provided the odds are long or the loss isn't going to be catastrophic. And the mechanisms that we have in our brains to um, frame attitudes to um, gains and losses enable people to manipulate our decisions about risk. Here's a classic example that was used even before the pandemic by researchers in behavioral economics to explore how policymakers thought about risk. It's called the Asian disease problem, and it's about flu, and it's basically um, about a policymaker, such as a prime minister or a health secretary, who's making decisions on vaccination. And so you put two options to the subject, having told them, imagine that you're the health secretary and that there's a, 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 a big flu epidemic uh, coming along. So option A is that we use um, our existing um, tried and tested vaccine. And if that is used, then 200,000 lives will be saved out of a possible 600,000 that could die from the disease. Uh, but the other 400,000 will die. And option B is that we use this new experimental vaccine and with probability one third, 600,000 will be saved, but with probability two thirds, none will be saved. And here 72% choose A over B. The second framing is, well, Minister, um, if you use the old fashioned vaccine, then 400,000 people will unfortunately die. But if you use the new vaccine, then with probability one third, no one will die. And with probability two thirds, 600,000 will die. And here, 78% prefer D over C. And so by putting problems like this to large numbers of experimental subjects, economists and behavioral economists have managed to map out people's um, appetite for risk as a function of framing. And this is also why marketers talk about discounts or saving. And fraudsters know that people who are facing losses will take more risks. So if you have been defrauded, um, then you may be um, subject to secondary victimization whereby the same fraudster or one of their associates comes back to you and says, we understand that you just lost um, 4,000 pounds worth of cryptocurrency as a result of being fished at Coinbase. We have got this service whereby we can get your um, cryptocurrency back. Um, you know, click here to learn more. And of course, large numbers of people will at that point click and many of them may, may fall into a secondary scam. People facing losses take more risks. Risk misperception in practice is much more complex than you get from um, pure um, prospect theory, as the kahneman Tversky theory is called. So why do we overreact to terrorism? Well, one is risk aversion and status quo bias. Um, the idea that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, but applied to society as a whole. 
Uh, we don't like social change, particularly if we're all uncomfortable. The second is the availability heuristic. Um, this is um, one of the ways in which um, our mental heuristics affect our mental processing because data that we can recall easily frame assessments. This is one of the reasons that the 9-11 terrorist incident made people worldwide much more sensitive about terrorism because everybody saw and remembered the horrific video of planes flying into buildings, whereas previously uh, the worst TV footage that we had on terrorist incidents were kind of you know, remote videos of bombs going off and um, ambulances rushing to the scene. So there was a much more vivid and easily available heuristic of how bad terrorism was and this caused people to uh, move the slider and um, overestimate the, um, the actual expectation of risk. A third factor is that our behaviour evolved in small social groups and we react against outgroups. In the ancestral evolutionary environment, our solidarity group, the people with whom um, you know, we shared our food and with whom we faced hostile tribes together, might have been between 20 and 200 people. And one of the main threats to human life in that environment uh, was tribal warfare against other groups. And this is baked in various ways into our reflexes. Another issue is mortality salience, because when you remind people of their mortality, of the fact that they will die one day, um, then the usual human reaction is to cling um, more firmly to whatever your core belief is, whether it's an identification with your in-group or an identification with your religion or an identification um, with your country. Um, you know, when you um, see or hear of death, uh, this is amplified um, for reasons uh, that uh, are not entirely obvious, but which psychologists have explained. We're also sensitive to agency and to hostile intentions, because in the ancestral evolutionary environment, um, many of us were killed um, not just by hostile people from the tribe next door, uh, but by lions, leopards, buffaloes, and so on. And so if any human or animal has got hostile intent towards us, that really raises our hackles. And so even although the greater threat to the human race may be global warming, you know, um, uh, the, the, the climate doesn't wear a moustache and it doesn't practice a strange religion and so we are not salient, that does not become as salient a threat to us um, as uh, somebody from an, a hostile culture who disrespects our culture and, and kills one or two of us. Another factor is that terrorize, terrorists maximise the threat. Most criminals try to be as unobtrusive as possible um, cyber criminals always try and stay at the level below which a vigorous police response would be um, um, called down on them. Um, the two types of uh, people who tend to be as annoying as possible are on the one hand terrorists and on the other, other hand people like climate protesters who try and do the most annoying things that they can possibly think of that um, fall under the category of petty crime and will therefore get them only short jail sentences, such as gluing yourself to a motorway, uh, whereas terrorists try and be as annoying as they possibly can while also um, committing crimes of serious violence. Police and politicians both like to play along and they will maximise the threat from terrorism and they will also talk up the annoyance from protesters. They can say, look how um, great, how, how, how wonderfully our police force is dealing with all these people who grew themselves to the motorway. So the practice of mis risk mis misperception is more complex. There are more things come into play and there are also the reactions of other players such as police and politicians and the security engineering book has got more on this in chapters 2 and 24. A mature understanding of risk um, can help us to manage risk better within the company. A typical company does this very badly because whenever a bad thing happens, they add another rule to the rule book. Um, they get the employees to watch a video and pass a test. And this can all be summed up as blame and train. In other words, when something goes wrong, it seemed to be the staff member's fault. So you blame the staff members and you train them. And then you end up with so many rules that people can't cope with them. And yet, as a practical matter, people will spend only so much time obeying rules. This is uh, called the compliance budget. 
And it's really important that you should understand this and choose the rules that matter. Okay, so um, in a hospital, for example, you might find that doctors will spend 11 half days a year on training. The pediatric resuscitation comes a course comes first because that's mandatory and then a bunch of others. And if you've got a course on password choice, I'm sorry, but it's going to drop off the end of the queue. An important insight here is that rule violations are often an easier way of working and sometimes even necessary to get the job done. And so what you should be doing is watching them, measuring them and adapt to them. And then you have to rearrange things so that the right way of working is easiest and the defaults are safe. Um, and when it comes to the public, of course, you can't train the public. I mean, you can bully them on things like password choice, which are often counterproductive. But the big question when dealing with members of the public or other people that you can't put through your training courses are what actions do you make natural? Because you see, most people won't opt in or opt out. They go with the default. And so governments are beginning to understand this and they try to set socially optimal defaults. We now have laws in Britain, for example, that you have to opt out of a company pension. Um, in the old days, some companies would let you walk in. And since many people couldn't be bothered to walk across the yard to the HR office and sign up for a pension, they ended up with no pension when they retired and um, um, had to get welfare benefits from the state. And now you've still got the freedom not to have a pension, but you have to walk across the yard and sign a form saying you don't want it. And most people can't be bothered to do that. Of course, um, this gets used in more than one way. Facebook's privacy settings are notoriously advertiser friendly. And every so often when enough people have opted out of sharing their information with advertisers, Facebook changes all the rules that everybody has to opt out all over again. And this is a clear case of where uh, Mark Zuckerberg's private incentive to maximize the value of his company clashes with the public goods um, of people having private spaces within which to, de to lead their online lives. And you might care to stop and, and think where else you've got this clash of incentives between public and private. In order to illustrate this, um, here's a photograph of a path, right? Where should the path be? Um, where the people walk um, or where the architect put the path? If you're ever designing a garden, you might care to watch where people walk uh, and then once people have made their decisions, um, you cause the path to go where people want to walk. And in the long run, that's um, what you often end up doing with uh, complex systems with large numbers of users anyway. Affordances are another concept that you may have come across in the usability course. Whereas the defaults are the things that are easiest to do, the affordances are the things that you can do. And one of the very famous papers in security usability goes back to the late 1990s, was uh, written by Alma Whitten and Doug Tiger. Alma was then a grad student at CMU and later went on to become Google's head of privacy. And she got a number of students at CMU to try and use um, a, an encryption program, PGP 5.0. And despite the fact that you'd expect that computer science students would be able to use uh, cryptography software, in the end, none of them could master the software, um, set up a public private key pair and send an encrypted message to a recipient, even given 90 minutes experimentation with the software. And this was a wake up call to the industry that many of the security products and services that we offer are not being used simply because they are unusable, except perhaps by their inventors. Now, somewhere between the, um, the floor of the default and the ceiling of what people can actually do is what they do do. And this is driven to a large extent by users' mental models. And here there's often a disconnect between the developers who know an awful lot about what the system is supposed to do and how the users see the system. They have folk beliefs um, about what a system is going to do and about the threats to it. Now, one of the interesting discoveries of recent years is that some people um, see threats um, to computer security as viruses, which could be mischievous or crime tools. Um, and um, people who see um, virus, uh, you know, viruses as mischievous, as, 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 as like graffiti, uh, for example, are more likely to think it can happen to them. Other people um, see um, 
computer security threats as, as burglars or people targeting big fish. And if somebody um, envisages uh, a hacker as somebody who only targets big fish, like uh, big companies or politicians, they will say, well, nobody's interested in me and they won't take any countermeasures. Um, if they see the um, cyber criminals as burglars, they may only want to protect um, anything that they have on their computer which they think to be of some value. And if they don't think they have valuable stuff on their computer, then they may not bother to take care. Uh, another uh, uh, lot of people see um, online harms as being like bad neighborhoods, as being like you know, either slums or uh, red light districts. And they take the view that you only have bad things happen to you if you go and visit porn sites or gaming sites. And so people who don't visit porn sites or gaming sites, your maiden aunt, for example, uh, may think that they're not at risk. And as a result, they may come to harm. And so one of the take homes from this is that people are much more likely to, to follow security advice if it's consistent with their mental model. And then you've got a problem to figure out what people's different mental models are uh, and how you could deliver that advice. Perhaps governments could give um, people security advice via Google Ads, but then if you've, got the, if you've got Google and the other big service firms training people in doing bad things, there are policy issues with that. Passwords are a thorn in the flesh of the security designer. Um, they are um, seriously expensive. Um, if you're a big firm like Google or Microsoft or Yahoo, you'll be resetting tens of thousands of passwords every day. And the mechanisms to do that and the people to support that cost an awful lot of money. Um, if you are setting up a small website for the first time, then of course you will use passwords to authenticate uh, users because they're cheap. Once you have set up a system, there's no marginal cost to enroll new users. And if your company becomes successful, um, you may end up with several million users on your first uh, million pounds worth of venture capital, so you don't have enough money to hand people some kind of physical security token. So they're inescapable, but there are three issues. Firstly, will users enter passwords correctly? And that can be different on phones from on laptops, and it can be quite difficult on devices with constrained user interfaces. Think smart speakers. Will users remember the passwords or will they choose weak ones and write them down? Or will you give them really dumb advice, such as telling them to choose their passwords, to change their passwords every month, so that you end up with Kevin06 being the password from June and Kevin07 being the password from July and so on. And the third question is, can they be tricked into revealing them? And that, of course, is what phishing is all about. Now, password advice given to users um, is usually pretty bad and it often amounts to something like choose something you can't remember and don't write it down. This is particularly a problem uh, with companies who want to dump liability onto their customers such as banks. Um, one of the uh, banks that I bank with um, insists that I choose an 11 character password including both uppercase, lowercase case and numbers. Um, it asks me for three of these every time I log on and it tells me that I'm not supposed to write this password down. And if I should ever complain that I've been a victim of fraud, the first thing this bank asks its customers um, is whether you wrote down your password. And if they answer truthfully, people will say yes. And then the bank says, well, in that case, it's your fault. So this is a complete swamp. And we know an awful lot about um, password and pin design failures. And if you want to go through this at your leisure, all I can suggest is that you read Security Engineering Chapter 3, where I collected a lot of the stuff that we've learned over the past 40 years on how to manage and mismanage passwords. One of the things that comes out of that is that there are very strong externalities um, in the sense that we discussed in the economics lecture in that one firm's action has side effects for others. Password sharing is a really conspicuous example of this. And whenever some gaming site gets hacked and tens of thousands of passwords are stolen, you see a huge surge um, in fraud and spam and other online abuse as people test out those passwords and they find that a few percent of them were used for Google and a few percent were used for Facebook and accounts get taken over and they use for, get used for spam and they get used for spreading hate speech and some of them are even used in bank accounts and so on and so forth. 
bulk password compromise is one of the big headaches in the industry and it tends to lead to recovery at scale but attacks also come through recovery um, because everyone wants recovery questions too and if a company keeps recovery questions on an insecure website then of course the hackers get those too and a few years ago um, Yahoo managed to compromise the password recovery questions um, of hundreds of millions of users as a result of which many users got hacked by people who use these password recovery questions to hack into accounts that they held elsewhere. That resulted in Yahoo being sold to Verisign for an awful lot le for, to, to, to Verizon for an awful lot less money than it would otherwise have got. So it has serious business consequences. Another externality is that firms train customers in unsafe behaviour such as clicking on external links and even the banks do this. We have come across cases where students of ours reported stuff as suspected uh, fish and it turned out that it was actually sent by a bank but by its marketing department and therefore for a URL that wasn't associated with the bank. And in one such case, even when we reported it to the bank, the bank initially said, yes, this is a fish and only later they realized, no, sorry, this was from our own marketing department. So there are all sorts of um, bad side effects and an awful lot of the training that people try and inflict on their users amounts to victim blaming, um, as I mentioned earlier in the case of the bank with the 11 character passwords. And finally, there's usability for developers. One of the things that we have realized over the last two or three years is that many of the security bugs that people exploit are due to tools that are simply too hard uh, for people to use safely. The C programming language itself um, is of course exhibit A here, but there are also things such as crypto APIs that default to electronic code boot mode. Both the Microsoft and the ARM offerings are um, at fault on this one. Uh, many more issues arise when busy programmers copy insecure snippets from online forums. Uh, and in fact, it's been suggested that one of the best ways to improve software code quality might be to go and fix up the code samples that are available on these forums. Um, I'll just say for now that usability for developers is now the most rapidly growing area of security usability research and practice. And if you can find ways in which our common security tools and cryptography tools can be made more usable for the average programmer, you know, not for highly skilled programmers with degrees from elite universities, but for the average bloke who's busy turning out code for a living, then um, in that way, you can actually do some good and make the world a safer place.